I want to talk about Operation War City. It was one of the largest airborne operations during World War II, although very few people have heard of it. That's reason enough to take a closer look, but it was also an operation that is highly interesting, I find, because you can see how the Allies learned a lot of the lessons from their earlier airborne operations to try to actually improve Varsity. Operation Varsity launched on the 24th of March 1945 to support the crossing of the Rhine. Around 16,000 American, British and Commonwealth men were dropped behind enemy lines. Considering these numbers, it was an even more ambitious airborne operation to the landing of Sicily, Normandy or at Market Garden. The idea existed already in 1944. Allied planners had been thinking about using airborne troops to bypass the Rhine's defenses, which were considered at the time to be very formidable. And by early 45, the plans had absolutely matured to support Montgomery's push over the Rhine. Major General Matthew B. Ridgway was chosen to plan the operation. He had ample experience, but thought the operation would actually hurt his future chances at commanding an army. Be that as it may, Ridgway got the job and he had to shelf his own personal self-development plans for now. The memory of Market Garden weighed heavily on Operation Varsity. Planners knew that an airborne assault would have to be tempered with a more realistic appreciation, shall we say, of what could be achieved. Varsity was no less ambitious to the airborne operations in Sicily, Normandy and in Market Garden in terms of men, material and equipment. It actually upped the ante. But it did so by examining the errors of the past. After all, the Allies were still suffering of Market Garden syndrome. For one, the units landed in a smaller area and in one giant wave, rather than being broken up like, for example, over Normandy. The intended landing area was barely more than 6 by 6 miles, and remember, this is 16,000 men that are supposed to land there. The landing zones were close to the objective, and except for the occasional power line, a railroad and a few windmills, the drop zones had no landing obstacles. Likewise, the landing zones were very close to the Allied lines, who launched their own assault at the same time, and thus could link up very quickly with the paratroopers. A daytime jump was prepared, as Allied planners assumed that German night fighters posed a larger threat than German air defenses. To prevent friendly fire on transporters, a whole corridor was created in which AA defenses were temporarily prohibited from firing their guns, so as to let the transporters pass in peace. The force would benefit from dedicated support of Allied fighter bombers and artillery, and additionally, supply drops were to be made directly after the landings. Taking part were the British 6th Airborne Division and the US 17th Airborne Division. The 6th Airborne Division was made up of the 3rd and 5th Parachute Brigade and the 6th Air Landing Brigade. This division included veterans of Operation Tonga and Mallard during the Normandy landings. Within the ranks of the 17th Airborne Division, the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment was the only one with combat drop experience. The 513th Parachute Infantry Regiment and the 194th Glider Infantry Regiment had none, although the division itself had already gained combat experience during the German Ardennes Offensive. In total, this force amounted to 9,500 Americans and 7,000 Brits with their usual Commonwealth assortment, especially Canadians. The chosen drop zone was to the east of the Rhine, north of Wesel, around the Diersforder Wald and close to Hamminkeln. Hamminkeln. Ham, Hamminkeln. Basically, they chose an area that included some of the most unpronounceable German names, and I say this as a German native speaker. The two divisions were to drop northeast of Wesel, the Americans taking the southern drop zone and the British the northern. They were to seize the area, including the Diersforder Wald, Hammelnkeln, Ham, you know what I mean, and bridges leaving over the Isel to cut off the Rhine defenders from immediate reinforcements. It was a real challenge to collect all the required material and the planes for this operation. It even had to be downscaled at one point, and men who had already completed their tour of duty were, well, shall we say, called back to take part in this final operation. More than 1,700 planes and 1,300 gliders were gathered, escorted by another 1,000 fighters. The Americans took off from bases in France. The rest of the force flew off from the southeast of England. It took a full two hours for all planes and gliders to be airborne, and the formation would slowly but surely come together at designated waypoints. The forces rendezvoused near Brussels, 
and would continue to gather towards the drop zones, following the navigational corridor in which AA defenses were forbidden to fire due to fears of friendly fire. For once, there was no repeat of friendly fire incidents, like for example we see during Operation Husky in Sicily in 43. Check out this video for more information on that. Flying towards the German lines, the formation was perhaps one of the most impressive aerial displays of the war, as it stretched for over 200 miles and it took 40 minutes to cross a single point, with one observer calling it an awesome spectacle. The first planes approached the drop zones at 0951 hours. Arriving slightly ahead of schedule, Allied artillery prematurely had to stop their preparatory bombardment of German flak batteries and positions, which was meant to last for another 10 minutes. On the ground, the Rhine crossings were on the way. Smoke, meant to cover the crossing, now carried over to the drop zone. The British and Canadians landed first, mostly in their designated zones. Taken by surprise and suppressed by artillery, German flak resistance was light, but soon intensified. 20,000 rounds of ammunition had been fired by Allied artillery to suppress them. This had seemingly little effect on the German flak. On the ground, the first paratroopers quickly took their positions, neutralized German artillery positions and defended their ground against the inevitable German counterattack. At 0953 hours, the American 507th jumped straight into Monty's smokescreen. Thus, true to the tradition of their trade, they partially missed their designated areas. However, they rallied on the ground and were in almost immediate contact with the enemy. Fierce but short firefights broke out between paratroopers and German infantry, anti-aircraft positions, anti-tank guns and a battery of artillery. The 513th and the 194th were less lucky. Coming in second, they were hit by the most intense flak. The German AA gunners taking a toll on the low and slow aircraft and gliders. Flying the new C-46 Commando on its inaugural combat flight, the 513th soon discovered that their new aircraft had a serious flaw. By the time they got to the drop zone, more than a dozen commandos were ablaze, with the fire spreading quickly from the wing to the fuselage. Before even dropping, the 513th took its heaviest losses of the whole day, and in the after-action analysis, the commando's lack of self-signaling fuel tanks, its wing constructions that actually allowed leaking fuel to pool along the wing route, as well as its hydraulical systems were all put forward as sort of possible causes for this propensity to burst into flames. But whatever the cause, as a result of varsity, the commander was prohibited to take part in any future airborne operation. As disastrous as the C-46's part was, it was also because of this plane that so many paratroopers could actually take part in the operation. It was, after all, meant to be a replacement for the venerable C-47. And that's why I think it deserves to have a more balanced appraisal in the future to understand the pros and cons. And that's why I talk about it in this video coming out later this year. But as a thank you to members and patrons, supporters already have early access. Back to the 513th. The chaos in the air only preceded chaos on the ground. After landing in what was supposed to be drop zone X, the Americans were soon surrounded by British gliders landing all around them. Yep, the Americans had landed in the wrong area and headed south towards their actual objective. Meanwhile, other elements of the 513th, like its field artillery battalion, were engaged in some of the most heaviest fighting that day. They had landed in drop zone X, right in front of German field positions, without any dedicated infantry support, and the Americans distinguished themselves in that firefight until the end of the afternoon. Quick intermission here, if you want to know more about how Operation Varsity fits into the wider operations about crossing the Rhine, check out this video by my buddies over at Real Time History. Their new video coming out soon looks specifically at that issue, and they produce some absolutely fantastic work, having also visited those battlefields themselves. The gliders of the 6th Air Landing Brigade also had a tough time. Not only did they come in just as the Germans manned their guns, but they were released from too high altitude as well. While smoke helped the gliders to a point to hide from German flak, the gunners still had ample time to damage more than half of them as they tried to land. Having landed, the men secured the village that cannot be pronounced and the bridges over to the Isel. Like their Commonwealth counterparts, the gliders of the 194th suffered heavily. Landing in areas not previously secured by paratroopers, the light craft became the most obvious target for German machine gunners and anti-aircraft gun fire. Once on the ground, however, the men were able to rush to cover and started taking ground. 
While the Allies secured most of their objectives, German flag still remained a threat. The crews of 240 B-24s, coming in low and slow, discovered this to their cost. Dropping their supply containers from a low altitude and at slow speeds, they became casualties of German AA fire as well. It is estimated that only about 15% of the dropped supply landed in Allied hands. Once again, the operation highlighted how precarious airborne operations were, but the planning had mitigated the worst. By the end of the day, the paratroopers started linking up with the advancing Allied ground forces, and some of them had seen very little action, whereas others had been locked in very sort of intense and deadly firefights with Germans occupying key buildings in the area. The operation, if compared to Sicily, Normandy, and Market the Garden, seemed to have been a complete success. But varsity soon became known as a costly affair. Amongst the Americans, the tally was an estimated 159 KIA, 512 wounded in action, and 800 missing. Among the British, it was 340 KIA, 700 wounded, and 320 MIA. Although I am not sure, I assume the high MIA figure was mainly due to the men lost in aircraft and gliders. 62 transporters were shot down and 402 damaged. The higher number among the Americans points to the more disadvantageous position of having come second in the formation of planes, but also because of the C-46 Commando. Out of 96 brand new C-46s, 19 were lost, 14 due to fire, and 38 were heavily damaged. Again, check out my future video on that issue. The overwhelming majority of the gliders were also completely unsalvageable. Of the resupplying B-24s, 15 were shot down and more than 104 were damaged. The operation left a sour aftertaste between the British and the American commanders. Losses on the ground were relatively light, as German resistance proved to be very limited, well limited considering that they had been crossing the Rhine, and that had gone easier than expected. And as said, the majority of the losses actually took place in the air, and this was due to German flak, which had an easy time due to the low and slow transporters that were coming over, and of course the gliders that were coming in as well. Various commanders thus had argued that the operation had been completely unjustified. Especially among the Americans, there was quite some anger. Uh, even allegations that Montgomery had essentially ordered Operation Varsity only to further his own motivations and goals. With the benefit of hindsight, one can see why they would say so. Although it must also be said that on the whole, everyone overestimated the Rhine's defenses and the opposition in the West that Germany could still muster in March 1945. And it is partially due to that overestimation that the Rhine crossing probably went as smoothly as it did, because the Allies came at it with an absolute overkill mentality. Do you want to know more about the Allied liberation of Germany? Get to see how Varsity connects with sort of the Rhine crossing operation in general, and also what happens as those men start hitting the ground, then why not check out this video by my friends over from the Real Time History team. Uh, their episode comes out at this time. Yes, I know that's very German. I've worked with them before on 16 Days of Berlin, on their Rhineland 45 documentary series as well. They do absolutely fantastic work. They go out, they have visited and filmed these battlefields. And I have a link in the description for that as well. So do check out that video as well to sort of get the larger picture. Now I hope that you found this overview of Operation Varsity interesting. Please let me know what you thought about this, uh, this operation and also of course also this video. Was it necessary? Were you surprised by anything you saw here? I look forward to your comments and feedback and I also want to say thank you to viewers like yourself who support me over on Patreon or via YouTube memberships or via PayPal. Uh, you provide an absolute fantastic support to this channel. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, if you are interested in supporting this channel, you will also get things like early access to videos, Discord access, and we also have a bi-weekly, sorry, yeah, bi-weekly or bi-monthly. Well, twice a week, no, twice a We meet twice a month on my Discord server to have a chat about aircraft. There, I got it in the end. Anyway, I wish all of you guys a fantastic day. Go out there, be with your friends, with your family, see the world, have a fantastic journey through life. I got very philosophical there. I didn't mean to do that, but you know, it came from the right. I'm just going to end the video here. I can't even speak English anymore. Have a good one. See ya. Take care and see you in the sky. Around the Diersforst der Wald and close to Hamminkeln. 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 Was zum Teufel? Hamminkeln. 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 Hamminkeln.
Hamen Kern, Hamen Kern, and close to 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 Hamen Kern. Oh my God. <laughs>